of our liquids and solids lecture. Uh, this is going to focus on how to read a phase diagram, which is, in all honesty, on the AP exam, there's usually at least one, maybe two multiple choice questions about this, and sometimes you have to interpret one on a free response. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and teach this to you guys as though it were at an AP level, so here we go. All right, first thing that we need to talk about is vapor pressure. <clears throat> And this is, let's say we had um, a, a container, just any old container, doesn't really matter. But the thing is it had a lid on it. And there's some liquid down in here. <clears throat> well, at whatever temperature you're at, there's always going to be a few particles of this liquid, this is a liquid down here, that are going to have the energy to escape off into the gas phase. The lower the temperature, the fewer the number of particles there are going to be that have the energy to escape the liquid phase and become a gas, but there's still going to be some. Um, now, the vapor pressure is a measure of the pressure of the gas in this area right here. Now, a liquid that has a weaker IMF, such as um, a nonpolar substance like, say, hexane, which will be in your lab. Um, hexane is a nonpolar carbon hydrocarbon. It's a straight carbon chain, six carbons, hex, six, hexane. And <clears throat> it is nonpolar, so the only... IMFs that it experiences are your London dispersion forces and so because it has a weaker IMF it's going to have a higher vapor pressure than other substances at the same temperature because it evaporates more easily whereas something like water which has the hydrogen bonding it will have a lower vapor pressure because it's stronger IMFs contain it better keep it in that liquid phase a little better <clears throat> And increasing the temperature is going to increase the vapor pressure. And this just kind of makes sense because the vapor pressure is caused by the number of particles that have the energy to escape the liquid phase. Well, if you increase the temperature, you increase the energy present here, which means it's more likely that you're going to have more particles that have the energy to escape off into the gas phase. Now, a little definition here. The temperature at which the atmospheric pressure equals this vapor pressure right here, that's the boiling point of the liquid. Um, and normal, normal boiling point is a temperature at which vapor pressure equals one atmosphere. And the reason it's one atmosphere is because this is normal pressure. Um, this is standard pressure. One atmosphere of pressure is the pressure experienced um, on a normal day, sunny, not stormy, at sea level. Now, of course, this pressure decreases as you increase in altitude, um, but this is considered standard pressure, so the normal boiling point is the temperature at which this pressure equals one atmosphere, and that's when water boils. So, like, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, well, then that means at 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is 100, or is one atmosphere. So moving on from there, going into phase changes, we did a heating curve back in the fall when we put some ice in a beaker and we had a graph that you guys drew. Um, let's see, what was it? I think it was temperature. No, temperature was here and energy was down here because we were applying energy from the hot plate, heat energy, and we were measuring temperature. And so we started out with a beaker of ice, and chances are you saw a little bit of an increase as it went from the temperature of the freezer to the actual melting point of water. And then once it reached the melting point of water, zero degrees Celsius, it flatlined until all of the solid had melted, and then at the point at which there was no more solid, then the energy that was being applied, see here the energy is increasing, but the temperature is not changing because all of this energy was being used to break the intermolecular forces of, in our case, the water. And so now once all the solid is gone, the energy is just simply increasing the temperature of the liquid until we reach another critical point. And this would be, for water, it was 100 degrees Celsius. And this would be the boiling point. And at this point, the temperature is going to stop going up again, and the energy is 
being used to overcome the IMFs of the liquid phase so that the substance can escape off into the gas phase. And this again would continue, if this was a closed system, this would continue until all the liquid was gone and you had nothing but gas and then the temperature would just continue to go up until you reached the next phase. Um, but so we did one of these way back in the fall. This is not a phase diagram. This is a heating curve. We are going to be talking about phase diagrams mostly on this. But just to kind of refresh your memory, this right here represents the heat of fusion. That's the phase, the amount of energy needed to go from solid to liquid or liquid to solid. And this right here is considered to be the heat of vaporization. Um, it's either the heat that needs to be added to vaporize the liquid or the heat that needs to be removed to, to condense the liquid. And nonpolar substances tend to have lower uh, flat lines, critical temperatures, than polar substances because of the difference in IMFs. When you have a weaker IMF, it's easier to go into the higher energy phase phases. It's easier to be a gas because you don't have the IMFs holding you together into that liquid phase. Uh, you can look at this if you want to. This is just straight vocabulary. All right, so what is a phase diagram? Well, instead of relating temperature and energy, we're going to relate temperature and pressure. So this is, you know, a little bit of an extension, I guess, on Gay-Lussac's gas law, except that we're dealing with solids and liquids as well. And it shows the three phases of a substance, and it also shows you where all three phases will exist simultaneously. And this is a really wicked thing. And you can search for other videos, uh, the triple point of water, triple point of carbon dioxide. If you um, yacht, uh, search for those videos on YouTube, you'll find some very, very interesting, fascinating videos. Um, and so this is a phase diagram. This one specifically is for carbon dioxide. Um, and I'm not really concerned with the numbers down here. These are just labeling the specific points. I'm going to tell you what these points are uh, in just a second. First of all, we need to label, since this is a phase diagram, we need to label the phases. So these diagrams are sometimes affectionately called butt diagrams. And the reason for that, if you kind of look at it, you'll see it looks like a little bit of a tissue. And a nice thing about remembering these as butt diagrams is you'll never forget where the gas goes. Gas always goes right here. Oh, hey, look, we're still at a white pen. Let me switch to black pen. The gas is always in the bottom right of a phase diagram. And then the liquid is always in the center. And the solid is always on the far left, upper left, if you want to remember it that way. Um, and so the lines that separate these three phases, and I want you to think of these as three distinct lines, not like one line that has a bump in it or one line that splits or anything like that. Think of these as three distinct lines. The line that separates the solid from the liquid represents the solid liquid phase change or the melting and freezing points. So you can look at a phase diagram, find the pressure that you're currently at, and find the melting and freezing point for the substance that you're dealing with. You know, you just kind of, you know, let's say we're at whatever this pressure is right here. Well, then you trace it over to the line and trace it back down, and you'll be able to find your temperature. This line right here that separates the liquid from the gas, well, of course, logically, that is the boiling condensing point. Whoops, forgot my eye. Boiling condensation point depending on which direction you're going, if you're adding heat or removing heat. And then, of course, that leaves this little guy right here, the line separating solid from gas, and this would be the sublimation deposition point. So anytime you're experiencing a change in pressure or a change in temperature, and you cross one of these lines, you've gone through a phase change. For example, let's say we took the temperature of this substance and let's say we're at you know, constant pressure but our starting temperature was here and we increased the temperature to this point right here. Well, that would mean we started out with a solid, increased the temperature of the solid until the solid melted 
and then we continued increasing the temperature of the liquid to this point. So anytime you cross one of these lines, you're experiencing a phase change. So there's a couple other points I want to point out here. This guy right here where all three lines come together, <clears throat> this is the point at which all three phases will coexist and all six phase changes will be happening at the same time. And this is called the triple point. And then up here, we have this temperature and pressure. And above this temperature and pressure, you can't tell the difference between the liquid and the gas phases anymore. And the reason for this is you're at such a high temperature. I know 31.1 degrees Celsius is not really that high of a temperature, but for CO2 it is. You're at such a high temperature that the particles are moving super duper fast. So it has to be gas because gas particles move very quickly. But you're under so much pressure and 73 atmospheres is a lot of pressure. You're under so much pressure that the particles are so closely packed that you have to be a liquid. But you're moving so fast, you have to be a gas. You're so close together, you have to be a liquid. At this point, it's just, you can't tell. And so they just called a supercritical fluid. Um, because remember, liquids and gases are both fluids. And since you can no longer tell the difference here between a liquid and a gas, it's just now called a fluid. Um, and super cool video, if you look up, um, supercritical fluid, uh, I think it's helium. I'm not sure what the substance is, um, but it's a video and it is just wicked, wicked awesome. You should totally check it out. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to point out about this? Oh, the um, slopes of these lines. These three lines all have a positive slope. And what that means is that if you're looking at each line, the, the state that is on the left of the line is more dense than what's on the right. You can kind of think of it as the line leans towards what's less dense. Or maybe you could think of it as the extreme density of this guy is pushing the line away. Same thing with this line right here. The liquid is going to be more dense than the gas because this is a positively sloped line. Same thing down here. This is a positively sloped line, and so the solid is going to be more dense than the gas. And in fact, every single phase diagram that you will ever deal with has a positive slope for all three of these lines, except one. This is the phase diagram for water, and it's still solid, liquid, gas. <clears throat> and you'll notice that the slope of the solid gas line is still positive, the slope of the liquid gas line is still positive, but the slope of the solid liquid line is negative. And what that means is that the liquid is actually more dense than the solid. And you guys all know this, ice floats. Ice is less dense than liquid water. But this is the phase diagram that shows it. The line separating solid and liquid representing melting and freezing is a negative slope, which means that the solid is actually less dense than the liquid. Oh, and I wanted to point out one more thing back there, I forgot. Whatever is occurring at one atmosphere of pressure, that's the normal phase change for that particular substance. So at one atmosphere of pressure on water, you can see we cross through the solid liquid line at zero degrees Celsius, because water melts or freezes at zero degrees Celsius. Um, and then we hit the liquid gas line at 100 degrees Celsius because water boils or condenses at 100 degrees Celsius. You don't ever cross the sublimation line with water because at one atmosphere, there isn't a normal sublimation deposition point for water. Going back to carbon dioxide though, there is. Because you see here is one atmosphere, and you follow that across, and the only line that you actually cross is the sublimation deposition line. And so that's why carbon dioxide is called dry ice, because the liquid phase doesn't exist under normal conditions. You have to put carbon dioxide under quite a bit of pressure, above five atmospheres of pressure, in order to get liquid carbon. Um, so this is the only normal phase change that carbon dioxide undergoes. And I'm pretty sure this is just some definitions about the different kinds of solids. We've talked about them before. Um, if you need a refresher on your types of solids, you can go back and watch the types of bonding videos where, you know, molecular solids, this is a typical covalent compound. Covalent network solids, these are your diamonds and silicon dioxide sand. Um, ionic solids are your typical ionic compounds. And metallic solids are your typical metallic compounds. 
Um, if you have any questions about how to read a phase diagram, just uh, send me an email or if you're one of my children, I'll see you in class and you can ask me then. Y'all have a great rest of your day.